What do you think of my banana? Do you think anybody would buy a banana? <laughs> yeah, I have not made a decision uh, whether I put these together or not. Uh, and threes might be a good idea. <laughs> Or just actually, I thought of just tacking them up, you know, using those little clips and making a whole wall of them. The bananas are very handsome. You know, it's a nice image. There are everything in the world is either oval or phallic. Look at nature. These bananas were something that I just sort of came by, you know, instant. <laughs> Just play, really. Well, holography and installation um, has have to go as they have to go. They can't be taken apart. Right. And one piece here and one piece there. But this is sort of working. Fun. Fun. Hello, and welcome to Dead Air Live. My name is Michael Hall, and tonight we're fortunate to have as our guest a pioneer in the world of fine art holography who has, uh, her career has spanned half a century in the performing arts, in theater, in radio and television broadcasting, as well as the visual arts. She's worked with scientists throughout the world to develop unique and effective imagery for holography and, and the issues that her works address speak to us individually as well as society in general. Uh, please welcome with me Harriet Kasdan Silver. Thank you. How are you doing tonight, Harriet? I'm doing very well. How are you? Very good, thank you. <laughs> that the introduction that we just saw uh, was showing a series of digital prints, which you've done recently, a series of bananas, mm -hmm. which is unlike your usual work, the 3D holo holographic work, but how would you like to talk about that project briefly right now? Okay. Uh, the bananas do relate to my work, to my holographic work, in that, um, well, the imagery itself, I mean, the, it's obviously a phallic image, and, but everything in the world is phallic or, or oval, one or the other. <laughs> so, doing the bananas was just, uh, an impetuous thing. I, I, we had bananas, and I had a new printer, computer printer, right. and um, and look at that color coming off the printer. So I thought, oh, I'll just play with it. And uh, you know, it's uh, for me, it seems like uh, instant art. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, the instant art relative to holography, which takes so long, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting the lab set up, and even before that, there are always a million arrangements yes. um, to have to deal with, to get the people of the lab, um, the shooting in my studio, mm -hmm. and this, I just put the thing down, <laughs> and there were my bananas. There you go. That's a very interesting that you can switch from a very technological, intensive uh, project involving many people to such a simple project involving just a new piece of office equipment yeah, you bought. I can't tell you what fun that is. That's great. That's exactly why I want to do some more of that kind of thing. Um, it, it's so calm. <laughs> it's like, it seems to me like yeah. the easiest thing in the world, you know. Right. Um, but I have to, I, I have to go back a, as far as the phallic image. Long ago, well, it was 74, I think, I did a piece called Phala, which I think you're going to show here sometime. Mm 
Um, and that piece was at the ICP in New York. Institute of Contemporary Photography, mm -hmm. right? Um, anyway, it was a fair line. It was, um, it, uh, it, it irked, annoyed, bothered a lot of people. The only people that liked it were women and gays. I shouldn't say the only people. That's the majority. I don't when was this exhibit? Pardon? When was this exhibit? In 75 at ICP. Right. I had other works there. Yes. Uh, at any rate, I had played with this um, image at Brown University, and um, they didn't mind at all. But at the museum, the, um, the director of the museum kept bringing his friends to show them my Thela, Thela being two of Thela's. Thank you for clarifying that. Pardon? Continue. Um, anyway, so I'm just tying these bananas into that image. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was wondering if you would be willing to talk about your holographic work in very simple terms. If you could describe to our audience what a hologram is and very simply how you go about creating one. Do you sit in your living room and tell yourself and wonder how that television image got into your living room? Sometimes I do, but most well, people do not. Perhaps do. I do. But most people don't do mm -hmm. that. So why do we have to explain hologram? Well, well it, I think it seems we have to, Mike, you're right. <laughs> because we don't have a real hologram here. That's true. Uh, but there are, will be a lot of images of hologram. Um, OK, by all means, what is a hologram? What is a hologram? <laughs> <You're sorry. laughs> OK, I'll try that one. A hologram is what appears to be a three-dimensional image in a two-dimensional art piece. So even though it's, in many cases, a framed work of art, you can look at it from different angles and see uh, different perspectives on the subject as if it were a sculpture. Does that? As if it were a sculpture. As if it were a sculpture. Great, you're doing fine. <laughs> what was your next question? <laughs> My next question. Well, that may bring us to the next video clip, which is uh, a piece I shot at the Art Interactive in Cambridge about a year ago. It was during an exhibit of yours in which you had three pieces, all holograms, and you were describing uh, some of the techniques you used uh -huh. to, a <clears throat> to a group of students uh, on that occasion. Okay. All right. So let's uh, roll with that tape if we have it. In the laboratory, you have a reference from laser. And um, the laser runs the object. The reference team goes at the subject. The object beam goes around the subject, and when the two of them meet at the plate, the two beams, the light waves actually, meet at the plate that's going to be exposed. Uh, they form an interference pattern like this, which causes the recording of the light waves from the subject onto the emulsion on the holographic film of light. Um, so, now, <clears throat> I want to say these angles of the lights to the peak are approximately the angle at which the reference beam came to the unexposed peak in the laboratory. If I change the light, the colors will change, and not that much, but a little. And the angles make it look different. And this piece here, which I usually have on the floor, uh, is a pseudoscopic image. Maybe I better not give it to you. 
So this is more realistic in that too. And this one, because I like the way it works as a stroboscopic image, but I, I turn the piece around. <laughs> and uh, I get this craziness, which I like a lot. Mm -hmm. That actually is my favorite piece of the three, but I like it better on the floor. Every time you move it, every time you move the angle of the light, the piece is clean. And these are uh, three artists from Fort Point Channel, which is where my studio is. And it was a grant from the Fort Point Coalition, Fort Point Cultural Coalition, uh, to do this. And it was in, to do whatever I wanted, but this is what I proposed. Three artists from Fort Point. Uh, the piece was <coughs> shown at South Station for two weeks during Fort Point. Um, artist community open studio. So these guys are life size and South Station didn't object for some I was so thrilled that they didn't object to this lady present deli coming up. And it really sticks out of the whole of them. Like these are all on the back of that. But this one, this hologram, a woman, a pregnant lady is coming out of the whole of them. Like I'm the whole of them and there's her stomach. Two or three of two or three to that. Um, now all of these people are artists and there is a woman down here who I think that lost. All three of them are artists and they are from Fort Point. And you know all about the business going on at Fort Point with the artists being put out because it's after the big gig, it's going to be a very big commercial area. So it's really bad, I mean, you know, that so many people have already moved it. And um, not because they wanted to. And the rents are going to go way sky high, and it's a mission. So these people are talking about that situation. Um, under a dome, an audio dome, where the secretary is, the old girl would be about here, no, further back, about 10 feet back. Uh, and you could hear their voices, the vo these people's voices. So I've been doing a lot of that um, sound and visual, well, actually throughout my career, but recently uh, with these audio zones, which are made by Kevin Brown, who's an audio engineer. Um, recently I've been doing that combination and enjoying it tremendously because I have a background in theater, radio, television, all before, <laughs> all before I focused on visual art. These particular pieces, which I did in a laboratory in Chicago, I've been invited in the last years uh, to work with scientists in various laboratories uh, in the world, actually, not just in this country. So this lab was in Chicago, and uh, the particular system that they had up could only give me, yeah, this green and uh, orange. Uh, but actually, this is a system that's quite primitive for holography, if you can call 30 years back primitive you know, 35 years or so when it all started. Um, it's a one beam system, which I won't go into, but, and the pieces are not as bright as these. These pieces are really bright. You can see them in uh, whatever light, I mean, you know, the sunlight coming in, or however bright it is, and it's a completely different system from this one. But I don't just look for brightness, it's really feeling uh, inside. Uh, yeah, I want the pieces to talk, not talk under the audio dome, but express some kind of emotion to the viewer.
Well, that was interesting. Unfortunately, I did not include video of the works she was talking about there. So now we can move on to a, a portfolio, so to speak, of yeah, Harriet's yeah. work. Uh, some of this are still images, but some are video in which I attempted to find or to uh, depict the three-dimensional quality of the works by moving the camera around the images themselves. So if we can launch that next tape and Harriet can discuss uh, the works themselves as they appear on the screen. Oh. <laughs> oh. This is a picture of your <coughs> grandchildren, is that right? That's my daughter mm -hmm. and her two children, two grandchildren. Beth is my daughter and Rebecca and Ryan are the grandchildren, are her kids. You, know, you did exactly what you said. You, you <coughs> moved the camera around Absolutely. to show what happens when a person moves around. I like the way they fade out into the, mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the stuff <laughs> sure. in the studio. This is a detail of a work that's in your studio um, of the Fort Point Coalition work that you were discussing on it the was, previous yeah, tape. It, this was um, commissioned, well, it was, a, it was um, a grant from the Fort Point Coalition, Cultural Coalition. Uh, dealing with Fort Point artists, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I think I, I already talked about that, right? right? So I won't go into that. But this wonderful lady that we're seeing, I assume we'll see Todd Geeg. Um, the lady is uh, a photographer. These people are both photographers just by chance. And the name of the piece is We Are Here, meaning that we artists are here and we're not going any place. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> this was an experiment I tried by taking the Is roll it? of film and scanning in individual slides from the material used to create the hologram. And so I created this kind of panoramic view of the subjects as they are turning and being photographed for the hologram. And you can tell the baby wasn't too pleased by it all because they had to stand, be very still for several minutes while this turntable revolved and the camera could take incremental photographs to get the 3D image. That was nice. I like that. Thank you. Very much. And, and this is the uh, work called Corpse, correct? Yes, it is indeed a work called Corpse. This I made in Belgium at the University of Ghent with another corpse. <laughs> I think I have a few corpses. Uh, they're all myself. There's something, I was working with a pulse laser for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, no, it wasn't for the first time, it was the second time. <laughs> I always said if I ever got to a pulse laser that I would um, shoot corpses because the pulse laser seemed to make everybody look like a corpse. <laughs> really? You know, in the other piece we saw with the pregnant lady, um, that's a whole different system sure. than the, with, made without a pulse laser. Uh, it's called holographic stereogram. Now this is another holographic stereogram or stereographic hologram, mm -hmm. uh, either way. This is a portrait I did of two beautiful children, and uh, I guess you didn't go round and round with this one. Yeah, I did, but it the, does move yes. though when you're the when lighting, you see the piece. It's, yeah, it moves from different angles, the lighting does very strange things. The camera doesn't know how to react in all situations, uh, but you can see. If you look at the girl's eye, every so often you'll see her blink. And the reason is during that, you know, when the photograph was taken at that instant, she was blinking, but it got integrated into the hologram. See right there. 
And so s very slight movements are picked up, uh, which actually, for me, makes the piece come alive. The blinking? Yes. Yeah, I, it does help sometimes. Oh, now you're turning. Mm -hmm. This is René, uh, which I made in Belgium. Um, all the pieces from Belgium are <coughs> a primitive, if you will, form of holography. That is, it's a system invented by a Russian, Denisia, and it's a one-beam system rather than the usual people use now, which is a two-beam system. And um, the one-beam system worked for me in that the images, the people, looked alive. Mm -hmm. I felt much more alive than they do with a, uh, <coughs> a more powerful pulse laser. This one was not all that So powerful. the pulse laser is more like a instant photograph, is that right? It's like a, um, it's like a strobe light. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this is one of the pieces that was at the Yarn Interactive that you were describing. I can't make this out. <laughs> well, is this one of the things you're parts, blocking yes, out? Certain parts were obscured to meet community standards. What is this image? It's so funny. Where That's, did you, you ever get? Oh. You don't even recognize it. <laughs> it was at Arts Interactive. That's right. Yes, yes. Oh, my land. Look at that censorship. <laughs> oh, what a panic. So we can talk about that in more detail. Yeah. It looks pretty good there. <laughs> <laughs> the bodies look pretty good. See, this is the one beam system also. Um, and so is this. This was made not at the University of Ghent. It was, um, I went to a lab in Chicago to make this and a number of other pieces. This is a self-portrait. Oh, good. Um, <coughs> which is actually uh, showing now at the De Cordova Museum. And these are still images, not the, uh, the video that I was shooting earlier. Um, again, this is slightly obscured. Is this Van Ecken Bar? Yes, it is. Um, is it censored? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's hard Funny. to see it. Okay. Well, if you like, if you would like, we could talk about censorship. How has censorship affected your work over the years? It didn't. I just did what I had to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, uh, but. Uh, Yo, yeah, I wasn't going to be censored. I mean, I couldn't believe all that stuff when NEA took away grants. Do you remember that? Oh, that from Maple some Thorpe, people yeah. who were, um, well, one uh, was a performance artist, right? Anyway, they had given the money to the artists, and then I don't remember who complained or how or why. Ashcroft wasn't there yet, um, and they took the money back. Any A took the money back because this wasn't fit for the American public. Yeah, I want to say something about all that stuff. Um, for me, the body is very important. It's very beautiful. It's special. And it's natural. So every part of the body is just fine, in my opinion. Uh, and I think that's the way it should be. And, um, well, someone was telling me here right now, Mike, she went to see the work at the De Cordova. Yes. Well, I do have an installation now at the De Cordova. And um, it's a whole room, and it, one of the pieces is 70 plus 1 plus 2, which is nude. Uh, and they're nudes of me. And they're not nudes of me as a young woman, unfortunately, because I had a gorgeous body. But see, I think I still have a gorgeous body. <laughs> and, 
at seven, I'm not 71 and two anymore, I'm 79. Um, but the pieces were made in 71 and 72. And uh, going back to the story that the woman was telling me here, that she was with a 17-year-old boy mm -hmm. who, uh, what did she say? He was what? He was shocked. He was appalled, <laughs> yes. Appalled. Um, <sighs> Is that a typical reaction? Well, no. It depends how the kids were brought up. Mm -hmm. That is, my children and my grandchildren are not appalled. Mm -hmm. And others who are, I mean, children of other parents and grandparents who are more like me, much more liberal, even radical, um, those children are not appalled. It's only the ones from whom everything is hidden. Sex is hidden. The body's hidden. Um, God, we used to walk around nude in our house. <laughs> Looking at my husband, he's probably having a fit. <laughs> um, well, it turns out we have a clip, a video mm -hmm. clip, of you talking about censorship. It's very short. Uh, and if you'd like, we could run that right now and continue talking on the subject. Say that again, Mike. Oh, they're going to run a video clip. Oh. There we go. So this year is a very beautiful picture of a, a girl, and then a pretty body, I think, yeah. And then come these terrible things that had penises. Bailey, I should say. Is it all right to say that word? We'll find oh, out. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It's a word. Yeah. Cool. I mean, it is in the dictionary. It's part of the body. Why in the world should it not be able to be spoken? I couldn't believe it. This is somewhere out in the middle. <laughs> the, the printer? The printer said he couldn't show this part because of the... Uh, because of... Uh, wait, this is not... I guess it is. I'm not sure what that is. Now. Uh, because of the failure. So we could either just not do that. We just do the back in <clears throat> the back of the brochure in white. He would put black blobs <laughs> over these parts. Or, and I think we were, I was at the gallery, and they were talking to him, and I said, "Ask him if he'll do white blobs," <laughs> and he said yes, which I couldn't believe. And no one at the gallery wanted me to do this. They much preferred the black one. Right, right. Um, but the only way I saw to save the whole deal was to show up the censorship. Mm -hmm. I'd forgotten that. Yeah. So, okay. So, so your approach has been to highlight the censorship, to make it an issue. Say that again. To, if, if you encounter censorship, you would rather bring it out into the open to make it an issue. Absolutely. Right. Um, yeah, I think we should tell everybody that I have a very bad hearing problem, though I'm wearing very fancy, fancy computer hearing aid. So mm -hmm. I may have to ask Mike here to repeat That's fine with me. occasionally. I hope you don't mind. Okay, you want to know the story about censorship? Okay. Um, the first time I was going to show a hologram in Boston, <clears throat> uh, it was with the Boston Union, BVAU, BVAU, Boston Visual Artists Union. Okay. Uh, I was about to put on a show I've forgotten where. I seem to think it was in City Hall. And the show was shut down. Really? Not because of me and my work, but because somebody had painted within their painting. It was a portrait of somebody, and it had a penis in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, one of the politicians 
uh, said that piece had to come out. One of the Bostonian politicians. And the artist decided, no, we're not going to have the show without that piece. So guess what? The show never happened. Had nothing to do with me. But you know, it was so ridiculous. Of course, that wouldn't happen now. I mean, you've all seen there have been many sexual parts <laughs> um, in many, many shows since then. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of how long ago it was. It must have been a long time ago. Anyway, we did not have that show. In that show, I think I was going to have a um, either glass balls. That was the name of the piece, or uh, a couple of meat grinders that I had done. I just started holography mm -hmm. at American <coughs> Optical at that time. Right. And oh yes, and the head of the unit at AO that had asked me in to learn holography was there outside with all the rest of us at that show that didn't take place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was so disappointed. Yeah. Okay, so that's enough about censorship. Why can't people let live? I, I really don't understand. So, now well, we're through with censorship. If you'd like to, we could move on. There are a lot of subjects I know you want to talk about. Yes, like feminism. Feminism is a big topic. Maybe we could... What do you think of feminism, Well, Michael? that's an interesting question, but I'm not the guest tonight, am I? <laughs> what? I think that it's, it's great to have you on our show tonight. Yes. <laughs> to, to, to give us your views and your experience throughout the years involving feminism. Wait, wait, wait. You're not talking about feminism. You're talking about me. That's right. <laughs> and you're the subject of the show. And you won't talk about feminism? I might I, just leave. I'd be glad to talk about it on my own show. Well, seriously. Well, don't you think it's difficult for a man to talk about feminist issues? No, I don't. Hmm. There are many men who are feminists. Well, I consider myself a, a feminist in this sense that what sense? in the sense that I have over the course of my life with through my interaction with people encouraged women to break through the barriers that they have been that have been presented to them and to assert their rights in society to to create or to do anything that they dream of and I hope that I have not been a part of any of those barriers, um, but as you have reflected on in a, in a video we can bring up very shortly, uh, these, these rules of society tend to make us, uh, make us accept certain things that, that may make no sense whatsoever. But you were talking uh, the other day about an experience you had during the 50s in Wait. which in which you partially accepted the situation but that w at looking back at it later on in years you realized that it was actually in your words you used the word stupid that that you had played into uh, a role that was governed by the rules of society at the time, which you <laughs> later decided you didn't like very much. Right. You're very, you have a very good memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, he's talking about my being, having been on radio and television. Um, this is way before holography, but it was during the period that uh, women's liberation was coming to the fore. Relative to... Mm -hmm. What happened? It's okay. C continue. To show up the censorship. It's okay. Keep talking. Um, anyway, it was before, actually. This time was before women's liberation started. <clears throat> and uh, it was the early 50s. And I was on radio and television. On radio, my name was Lace, and on television, we made it formal, Miss Lace. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And I, I, yeah, I played directly to a male audience with a low, sexy voice. And you're right, Mike, I did not realize what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I was a huge success. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if you like, we can, we can look at that clip and listen to your comments oh, okay. that I recorded oh. the other day. Oh, you mean I've already talked about this? Okay. Yeah, we can talk about it again. To other countries in the world, the people that are above a certain line in this country have, you know, everything. Yeah. Um, and um, women as well as men don't realize how bad it can be. They don't stop to think about it in other countries. Now, the whole business with Afghanistan and Iraq, of course, had brought the women's question to the fore. And I was always a feminist. Um, well, I say that I was born a feminist. <laughs> uh, and maybe I was. Um, I am the only daughter of five siblings, and a, a baby daughter, that is. Uh, I have four grown-up brothers when I was born. So I lived my whole young life and adolescence with five fathers, my own brother and those other four guys. <laughs> I had a cousin in there, too, who was also me. And, you know, I was, re you know, I was really uh, into the whole idea of equality for women. Um, so at the very beginnings, the very birth of feminism, I was writing there uh, emotionally, and I, I was actively working on feminism. Then eventually it went into my work. I mean, a lot of my work has to do with it. I think when I got into broadcasting, I was not educated enough as far as the men-women scene went. Um, yes, I was the only woman on, for example, in the whole Boston area overnight. And um, then I had a show for a long time in Worcester. Uh, oh, then really discovered this sexy low voice that I had, you know, way down here, and I talked very softly. And so that's why I immediately said, no, it had nothing to do with feminism, like going into broadcasting. Because that's what they love, my sexy low voice. And I was not educated enough to realize that I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> oh, anyway. That went on for a few years, and um, on both radio and television. I don't like to call women stupid. They just—that's <laughs> the way the world operated. Uh, I remember going to my bank and to open an account or do something in my own name, and I was. I had been married. I was married at that time. Yeah. And um, I got so furious because there were rules that said I couldn't just open it in my name. This, well, again, it's a long time ago. We're still, we're st <laughs> okay. Welcome back. Mary and I were just discussing the number of topics we'd like to cover in the next 20 minutes. Um, Besides feminism, if you'd like to speak some more, I know I've talked more about feminism than you have, but yeah, you have. <laughs> if you would like, we can <clears throat> talk more about the politics of art or about the way... Well, <clears throat> the politics of art, is that what you said? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I've tried, I, I just said all that, that I tried to use uh, I mean, to me, using women in a particular way, I don't mean using, oh, I shouldn't say that. Using is a bad word. That's what men do. 
<laughs> showing women um, in a uh, feminist way. You know, what does that mean? It means, yes, they can be nude, but they don't have to be nude. And they certainly would not be the kind of images you see in the magazines and oh, especially all the porno stuff now. It's been around a long time. Um, okay, Mike, I think we should go into well, uh, a celebration of aging, uh, which is an installation that I did um, for First Night Boston in 2000. It was the millennium, and um, it was uh, quite a big project. And that it ties in also with politics. Oh, well, great. Well, aging is political. <laughs> it shouldn't be, I suppose, but it is. Um, because people have to fight their way, older people, fight their way to stay in the society, to, um, to not be looked at as others. You know, to make people realize that, yes, we're aging, we're, we have wisdom, we have wit, we have a lot of things that we can pass on and, and spread out to our own little worlds, let's say, if not the bigger world. And that's what I'm trying to do with Celebration of Aging, show as big a world as possible that aging isn't a terrible thing. Old is not a bad word. Uh, it's part of life. And it's a beautiful part of life. Actually, it's an adventure. Okay, let's share the tape, shall we? Sure. put the sound on. I heard a babble of voices. So I said to someone standing near me, what is that noise? Where is that coming from? And then I realized, I was so amazed that those were my people who were talking to each other. All types of entertainment, schools, homes, whatever. The century will be one in which man will be concerned with his place in nature. I do not think there will be as many revolutionary changes in technology. I knew I wanted to do very large holograms. I always want to do very large holograms, larger than I've done before. And I wanted them to be monumental. I came to Boston, as I said, in 1929, during the Depression. Things were hard. <laughs> I'm not afraid to die. I think I have peace within my soul, and it doesn't bother me. When the time comes, it comes. It's all, uh, you know. Well, I think about it every day, since I'm getting older and older, you know. But uh, I'm not worried about dying. I'm not afraid to. So I think I've done what I came here to do. I raised a family and saw them get on their own and be able to be independent and so forth. And I think I've done my task. The concept of a celebration of aging is indeed to celebrate age, to look on it as a profound, exciting experience 
There's nothing more vulnerable than aging. My name is Carl Houston. I was born in Texas. I've been uh, gay all my life. I went into my career, which I've had for 40 years, in 1959 in Galveston, professional female impersonator, stand-up comedian, and singer. Aging, that's another sad thing. If you are not young, attractive, or sexy, they don't want to have anything to do with you. And so when you get kicked around by the straight people and you get kicked around by your own kind, you finally have enough. The Audio Dome basically is a, a, a audio system that um, focuses sound to your ears and gives you almost a ho holographic audio image. And uh, part, of, part of the use of our dome is to put it in front of some display. And I thought how what an appropriate display would be, would be a, to be a hologram. So I, I approached Harriet with the concept of combining the two technologies, doing a, an audio dome with a hologram. The experience that I was looking for was really to try to make it as realistic as possible, to have that person standing right in front of you and, and making that experience as real as possible. Twice before, we've had a face-off between religion and science, and the world wasn't ready. And now we're moving into a period where, through genetic engineering, we're in charge of our evolution. We're move, shifting from man created in the image of God to man creating the image of man. And I'm not sure the world is ready. In, in, in High Tech, High Touch, this chapter, about genetic engineering and the implications is called from Galileo to Darwin to DNA. I don't know if you'll believe this or not, but all of a sudden it came to me. I mean, I just saw the whole composition in my head that that's the way it would have to go. I love the thought of people standing in the middle and being able to turn themselves around and seeing all these holograms at once. The circle itself means so much. Uh, it means for me and a lot of other people peace and womb and, and warmth. Um, a female. Nobody likes to talk about death, but uh, I do a lot of dreaming at times. I dream that I'm dead and in the coffin, and I'm looking at the people, and then I dream about people. And if I dream about them, and after a few days, maybe a week, maybe a month or so, you'll hear about somebody passing. And I don't like to do those kind of dreams. I don't like those dreams because I remember that something's going to happen afterwards. I remember the time when Marian Anderson, the singer, wasn't allowed to sing in the Constitutional Hall because she was black. I did domestic work, and I started at 20 cents an hour, because that's all I could get at that time. And you worked five hours for one dollar. In order to make two dollars a day, you worked 10 hours. So as I said, it was hard. I got uh, a request from Switzerland to leave the country. I had no place to go. My quota number wasn't up. My mother was living in Zurich. I was living in Neuchâtel or Saint Blaise, which is nearby. Uh, didn't know where to go, but I didn't verbalize this to myself. And I bought a number of vials of sleeping tablets, and I took an overdose. But I'm very strong, and I survived. <laughs> I had envisioned a glorious installation 
a glorious artwork, but I was unprepared, totally unprepared for it working as well as it did. I think this is the first project, the first art installation I've ever done that I was almost completely happy with. Oh, it was wonderful. I was thrilled. And I can't wait to put it back up again. <laughs> <laughs> It was a wonderful piece made by Marilyn Cass mm. about your show at the uh, First Night Boston. Would you, <laughs> I know that we're running rather short on time, would you like to move on uh, and speak about anything else that's on your mind? Well, I just want to say, Michael, you know, <clears throat> you guys here have a lot of guts doing these live programs <laughs> for a whole hour. Mm -hmm. An hour is a tremendous But we're running short on time. Yeah. There's so much to talk about. Yeah. Um, without editing or anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's good. Yes, I would like very much to just show some of the pictures. Okay, so we have another portfolio segment uh, which shows uh, some still images, and, uh, and I believe that's it. Uh, if we could bring that up. Yeah, this is this is the seventy Where's plus. Where's the stuff? The they forgot to block it out. Oh well, this is a last minute edition. But this is seventy plus one plus two, right? Which is uh, showing at the De Cordova right now. Which is what? Which is currently on display at the De Cordova. Oh, yes, the show at May the De Cordova, 30th. by the way, is very fine. Not just my work, but it's a, it's a show about identity. And uh, can anybody hear me? <laughs> oh, there's my special lady, the Venus of Billendorf, 91. This, for me, is a very political figure. As though that last 70 plus 1 plus 2 uh, is very political. And um, this is something that was commissioned by Sculpture Magazine. That is the Venus, what, not the fork. Hey, now you see why forks are so well known? Because they take a great picture. They were shown. Um, in Germany, in Casa, Documenta 6, and with uh, uh, artists and scientists from MIT at the Center for Advanced Visual Study, where I was... <laughs> okay, here are the phalae that she was talking oh about earlier. Due to so community fun. standards, we had to block better. out the entire contents of both frames. But the shot of the frames is very nice, I think, don't you? No, I think the I think the fairy looks better with the block out stuff. Right. <laughs> kind of looks more like a snow cone than usual, but Oh what a panic. <laughs> I do want people to know though that I did this fairy long, long ago. It was at Brown I was at Brown University, um, with my own lab and um dude well I won't I don't, I don't have time to give credits, huh? Oh, well, you can keep talking. Uh, anyway, Dr. Gerritsen uh, was a physicist at Brown who invited me to come and <coughs> do holography there. Um, so th what I started to say is that the phalae, when I did it in 73, 74, um, was not such a common image as it has become. Um, 
at this point. Uh, because to me, do I stay as far away from possible from anything that's trite. Um, I try anyway. I maybe don't always win uh, or corny. So at that point, during the Thales, it was radical. Did you do it for that reason? Were you challenging the art world at that time to accept imagery like that? Well, feminism was in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I surely was in feminism. And, um, yeah, as I, as I said before about parts of the body, every part of the body is valid. It's a valid image for art. You got more tape? We got, um, unfortunately, we've run out of time oh. for this segment. I would like to invite you back some other time <laughs> to talk about more things, if you're willing. <laughs> oh. uh, but I'd like to thank you for, for speaking with us tonight. And uh, we can... Now I'm going to put that black paper through the printer. You're gonna, this is funny. Screen. Watch this. Oh, well, you can't print on black paper. Why? Because the white of the paper is required to get the color of the yellow. The white shines through the yellow to get that color. I can't put it through black. Put you through can't black. print yellow on black. It'll come out very dark. <laughs> one do in a case like this? And this is hysterical. You can shoot the banana. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. I know <laughs> you have as much right to be here as we do. Right. We were going to do an interview for television. Do you know about how long you'll be? Uh, maybe for half an hour. Excuse me? Half an hour. Um, okay, we'll shoot the pictures. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Oh, we can look at the other stuff on the computer. 